Hello and welcome to your first chapter. We will spend the next few chapters on the Renaissance, which begins in Italy. Um, and we're going to talk specifically about Florence and that very first century of the Renaissance. So we're going to look briefly at patronage and civic virtue, uh, perspective and the viewer. I'm going to challenge you to look uh, at your text and find out more about Ghiberti's Jacob and Esau. Just because I don't cover it doesn't mean it won't be on the exam. Uh, we're going to talk about color and light and the language of classicism. So to start out, just to give you some context, um, what happens in the 15th century is that we have this revival of classical ideals. Now classical does not uh, have anything to do with class system. Classical has to do with looking back at ancient Roman and ancient Greek culture. Uh, the Italic Peninsula, instead of saying Italy, that's what we say because at that time Italy was actually several city-states rather than a single country. Uh, humanism. I really want you to think about humanism and the Renaissance as we look at these different artworks and works of architecture. Um, in the Middle Ages, we really focus on spirituality, um, pope, monarchy even, um, but it's, it's mostly about the spiritual virtues, and the spiritual stories, the religious stories. The Renaissance, however, is a shift to really sort of celebrating the human, looking closer at anatomy, looking at human achievements, looking at what we're able to push ourselves to do and the art, everything, uh, expressing the greatness of what humans can achieve. And that's very important because we see a shift from strictly uh, art that's telling Bible stories to art that's expressing the beauty of mankind, the ideal body forms, and other kinds of ideas. Um, so keep that in mind. We will talk a bit about new socioeconomic and political structures and how that creates new patrons and expanded trade routes that link major cities across the West and East. So that allows for a transfer of not only goods, but also ideas. We're going to look at new scientific discoveries that broaden the understanding of the natural world. So here we have this print, it's an etching from 1471, so not too long after we were beginning our discussion of the Renaissance in the 1400s, early 1400s. Um, but you can see that there's a new uh, study of perspective. So rather than this all just being everything's equally sized and placed in a single frame like we might see in Byzantine art, there's a sense of a single vanishing point, and we'll talk more about what that means but there's a sense of spatial illusion and what's close versus what's far away. One thing you will notice is this large dome in the middle of the map, and that is what we uh, refer to as uh, the Tuomo, and that is one of the greatest technical achievements in Florence at this time, and also the building that dominates the view of Florence. So there are some major power centers of power in the 1400s in Italy. Um, Milan, Republic of Venice, Republic of Florence, the Papal States, the Kingdom of Naples, the Kingdom of Sicily. Just to give you an idea that there's more going on than just Florence. Um, at this time, um, merchants and bankers really controlled the government of Florence rather than religious leaders or monarchs. And as they gain wealth, the merchants and the bankers become some of the most important patrons of the art. And they commission art that promotes civic virtue and political alliances. So civic virtue goes back to these classical ideas of uh, character and what makes man great. And then, of course, political alliances have always existed and continue to exist. Um, humanism. Uh, if you talk about it in the context of the author Francesco Petrarchia, uh, it's a renewed interest in grammar, ooh, logic, rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, music, astronomy, all these different fields of education. 
So this is architecture that was designed by the Colezo di Bartolomeo. Um, and we can see here a revival of some classical style. Now I realize this is uh, difficult and some of you may not have had 118, but some of the classical elements include um, the round arches, um, the uh, sort of cornice up here. Um, but what's really interesting about this building, two things. One thing, uh, this is a Medici palace. So the Medici are an extremely influential, powerful family of bankers. They're very important to the Renaissance, especially in Florence. And um, usually, if you build a palace, and then in the Middle Ages, you would build it sort of on a hill so you could defend it, and it would be um, separated a bit from the city. Well, one of the classical ideals and one of the civic virtues is that a leader lives among his people. So here we have a palace right in uh, the city. And um, the style of this first uh, register here, this first level of architecture, uh, it's called rusticated. See how roughly cut the stones were? Um, and yeah, it's just a, it's a different kind of concept of palace. It introduces the Medici family as the newly powerful in Florence. It ships, like I was saying, it ships away from the medieval. Um, and some of the way the architect chose to design um, the, the facade um, is based on the writings by an ancient Roman engineer named Vitruvius, which makes sense, right? Because the classical goes back to ancient Roman Greece. This is uh, perhaps the most famous landmark in Florence, the Duomo. Um, so this is the Florence Cathedral. And then up here uh, is um, the, the cathedral is also known as Santa Maria del Fiore. But it's been nicknamed uh, the Duomo because the dome here is so large and impressive. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, the dome. Um, there are some different things you can see here, like the bell tower, um, and I think right where my head is, you can see the baptistry. So the complex was begun in 1296 and not completed until 1469. So you can see a lot of different influence from different eras, like the cathedral, for example, is Romanesque. Um, it has this nice long nave. Uh, again, if you've taken 118, you might remember what that means. Um, there's also, if you see right here, it's kind of hard to see, there is a golden um, ball. And that, when you look at the skyline, is really stands out. So, um, there are a couple of ways artworks are commissioned. One way is there's a competition. You submit a sample of your work, and the best one wins. Or it's just a direct commission of either a guild or a group or a, a particular donor. Um, in this case, it's a competition. So there is a group called the Opera del Duomo, Duomo and the, wood, the Wool Guild. Um, held a contest for the baptistry doors. Um, and so the examples we are going to look at are gilt bronze. And this is by Brunelleschi. Um, and he's the one who designed the dome. So we're going to talk a little bit more about him. Um, the story everyone had to represent in their submission was the sacrifice of Isaac. So just a quick background here. Um, Abraham is a biblical figure who um, did not have any children until he was very old. And so it was a very special child that he treasured dearly. And to challenge his loyalty or to test his loyalty, God asked him to physically sacrifice him. Um, and so here we see Abraham up on the mountain. Here's, there's the altar. 
and you see um, Isaac, um, and he's about to sacrifice him, but the angel flies in from, well, let's see, for your view, flies in from the left and stops his hand um, from sacrificing Isaac. And then right by Isaac, you see that animal? That's a ram, and that was provided by God for the sacrifice rather than Isaac. So here's another version of the same story. Um, look how the angel uh, up there is foreshortened, the way it's flying in. Um, and then again, you have Abraham and Isaac and the ram. Um, so Gilberti wins the contest. And, um, well, we think. Some people say Brunelleschi won it and decided he didn't want to do it. But at any rate, Ghiberti is the one who did do the doors that remain. Um, and he knew a lot about metalworking. And he actually knew how to make the panels with much less bronze than what uh, Brunelleschi uh, was proposing. So that might be part of the attraction. Um, so here they are side by side. Um, the the baptistry itself is octagonal and has three sets of bronze doors. So these are the east side doors. Um, this quatrefoil shape, which is just the frame around the scene of Abraham and Isaac, is actually taken from an earlier artist, Pisano, who had done the baptistry doors on the south side. Um, I don't believe you can access it here on YouTube, um, but if you want to learn more, there is a site called Smart History, smarthistory.org, and there are all kinds of short videos about the artworks we're looking at that can be really helpful. So here we are uh, to the dome of the Florence Cathedral. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's an engineering marvel. Um, basically, there is all this weight that would come down normally on a dome, and then it would literally collapse on itself because of the weight bearing. Um, but Brunelleschi figured out this egg-shaped dome um, that has actually two dome shells uh, that you can see in this picture that help disperse the weight and a pointed arch to help reduce the thrust. Um, so typically, you would use a flying buttress, uh, which again, if you're from, if you've done 118, you probably remember. But um, they come out and down and take the weight bearing away from the uh, walls and out to the sides. But the um, people who organized the competition said they were not allowed to use flying buttresses. Any guess why? because they didn't want to look outdated, right? Medieval was, you know, oh, so many years ago. Now we're in the Renaissance and um, we don't do flying buttresses. So it's kind of a fun story. Um, so at that time, cathedrals, and, and really before that even, signaled political power, civic wealth, and religious authority. Um, the dome, um, the rib dome sits on a drum that spans 144 feet, so truly a marvel. We're going to talk a little bit about perspective. Um, we're going to talk about one-point linear perspective and uh, two-dimensional uh, representations of three-dimensional objects, which is what perspective is. This is St. Mark by Donatello. Yes, another one of the Ninja Turtles. <laughs> um, this was commissioned by the Linen Weavers Guild. Um, so one thing as part of humanism is that in order to show your virtue, you would do things to beautify the city. So they made the statue for the building that's got offices for different guilds. And um, of course, this would be facing the street and it's quite impressive. Um, one thing, if this is on the exam, you should note, is that St. Mark is standing on a pillow that's covered in linen. So it's sort of a nod to the Linen Guild that commissioned the work. Um, 
it's in this nice deep niche. Um, notice the way he's standing and his weight is kind of on just this one leg. That's called contraposto. Um, you can see that word also in your text. Um, but contraposto is in a very important stylistic carryover from ancient Greece and Rome um, that we see quite a bit in the Renaissance. Um, so the story on this one is they commissioned Donatello to do it. He makes it, and they're like, oh, oh no, this isn't right. Because what he did was he elongated parts of it so that when you look up, you see it um, as it should look. But if you're standing and looking directly at it, it looks absolutely wrong. So Donatello was a visionary, really, to think about how to make it look correct from the position that it was going to be in. There's also a bit of naturalism, especially in that pillow that he's standing on, um, and also in the drapery folds. And we talked about the light of So um, here are the Gates of Paradise by Ghiberti. So we see Ghiberti again doing this kind of gilded bronze um, doors. Now, Things have shifted a bit. Um, the If you can see, I know it's a small image, maybe check it out online. Um, but rather than um, making a single scene with kind of architectural elements to break it up, um, he's using perspective. And the way he's using it is the things at the back are very low relief, like they don't come far off the surface. And things that should be closer to us are in higher relief, meaning they're, they're um, carved farther away from the surface. And if we just go here, um, it's, so it's 10 panels of Old Testament scenes that are painted gold. And we talked about low relief. Um, when you look closely at one of these, you'll start to see what we call linear perspective. And we'll talk more about that, I think, in the next slide. Um, but also remember, uh, this is a time of celebrating humans. Well, Ghiberti included a self-portrait medallion showing the importance of individual artists in the Renaissance. So here we have a comparison um, of the baptistry door panel um, and the by Ghiberti and this. So you can see how things seem to recede into the distance. That's a one point perspective. And you can see how the figures closest to us are much farther from the surface than things in the very back, um, which is very different than the way he organized this earlier work, which really doesn't have a sense of receding space. And here this, that is again. Um, so I'm going to challenge you to do this on your own in the book. It tells the story of Jacob and Esau, and it takes you through different parts in this one panel. And it's a really good exercise for you to do on your own. This is Masaccio's Holy Trinity. Um, this is a great example of a uh, one-point perspective or off orthogonal perspective. Um, you can see everything's coming down here and everything is coming up here. And so it all beats right here, the head of Christ. Um, so the Trinity is the idea that God is in three forms. God the Father, which we see here. God the Son, which we see in Jesus being crucified. And the Holy Spirit, which is this dove above Jesus' head. Um, other figures, this would be the Virgin Mary and John the Baptist. And maybe most importantly, we have the actual donors who commissioned this painting represented kneeling at the cross. So uh, an interesting way to show your civic virtue, right? That you commissioned this artwork and that you're devout. Um, and that's something we'll see continue. Um, down here, we have what's called a sarcophagus, um, which is where you hold the remains of a dead person. Um, and on top is what appears to be a skeleton. And this is all painted. Um, but the skeleton is what we call a memento mori. 
And that just means it's a reminder of fleeting time and our eventual death. It's dark. Um, and there's an inscription um, above that skeleton that says, I once was what you are and what I am you will be. So very much about facing death. Um, the three forms of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, are referred to as the Trinity. So the composition is in a triangle to symbolize the Holy Trinity. Um, yeah, so we have the linear perspective of the lines coming up and coming down, um, which is math which is a mathematical intervention and um, enriches the meaning of this religious image. But this is a bit different. Um, this is a battle scene commemorating the victory of Florence over their rival, one of their rivals, Siena. Um, it's by Paolo, Paolo Uccello. And Uccello uh, doesn't quite follow single point perspective. It, it's close. You can see the lines here on the ground. You can see uh, the broken weapons on the ground kind of leading us backwards into the space. But when you look at the back of the space, um, it, it's, it, it makes the composition very flat rather than giving the illusion of receding space. Um, and it's a very chaotic kind of composition. Um, it's a unique style that gives preference to visual hierarchy over naturalism. So rather than just making this look real, um, things that are important are larger and the focal point um, because that is the artist's focus. Now we're getting to color and light. Um, this painting, Tribute Money by Masaccio, the artist who did the Holy Trinity, um, is actually three scenes in one single space. Um, and here we have a tax collector asking Jesus for tax money, his disciples protesting, and then we have Jesus who basically says, go fish, and the disciple goes and catches a fish who has the tax money needed in his mouth, which is then given to the tax collector. So color and space. Um, space here is created by atmospheric perspective. So things close to us are very clear and things in the distance are more hazy, which is what we experience when we look um, at landscape, especially uh, during sunrise and sunset. Uh, um, and then we have the color identifying the different characters. So. Um, Here's one of the disciples um, who is giving the money to the tax collector. The tax collector is seen here. Rather than reading left to right or right to left, with this being the first scene, the first scene is in the center. And really that's because the central figure is Christ. So we have Christ in the center, the fish uh, catch, caught here, and the tax collector taking the money here. And this is a very large fresco. So what's a fresco? Um, a fresco is painted directly onto a wall rather than on a wooden board or canvas. And actually at this time, canvas um, wasn't really something being used. They would use the wooden board. Um, it's very large and it's held up very well. Um, this is uh, Fabriano's Adoration of the Magi. Different, right? We, we feel kind of like we're going back to Romanesque or Gothic with all of this gold, and it's a religious subject, and there's halos. Um, so, and it is made as an altarpiece for a church. Um, it's very large, and um, the artist was really smart. He used what's called gesso. I don't know if you're an artist, you may have done this yourself. But it's a, sort of a cheaper medium that's made of enamel glue, chalk, and white pigment. And they were working with wood. So he covered the wood with this uh, medium. 
And what that did was allowed the paint um, that goes on top of it not to seep in and get lost like it would have if it was painted directly on the wood. Um, the predella here is sort of just the name for that bottom step of the altarpiece. What's interesting, we have this very rare thing right here, um, which is a nighttime nativity scene. And Jesus, or Christ the child, um, is, the, is the source of light. Uh, so very beautiful and unusual. Uh, something to note that I didn't go over yet is that um, Gentile Fabriano um, uses shimmering colors um, and optical studies he did on light and refraction. So really thinking about the effects of light and then creating effects of light by using this kind of gilded uh, structure. So this is very different, right, than what we've been looking at. And how is it different? Oh, I wish we were in class. I love discussion. Um, it's simple. It's humble, right? It's not gold. It's not big and, and complicated. It's not a battle scene. Um, it's called an Annunciation scene. And the reason why it's so humble and simple is that it was commissioned for the dormitory of a monastery. And um, in a monastery, you live a very simple, plain life. So it makes sense this would be a very simple, plain composition. And just so you know the story of the Annunciation, because it will pop up again and again and again. Um, so Mary is a virgin, um, but the angel Gabriel uh, that we see to her left um, announces to her that she will give birth to the Christ child, which <laughs> had to have been a bit of a shock. Um, but it's a very common scene to see um, in Renaissance and even later art. This is also a fresco, um, so it was painted directly onto the wall. Um, and here's just a comparison of like the really gilded gold, crazy busy composition of the Adoration of the Mag Magi and then this very simple Annunciation scene. The language of classicism. So again, classicism is looking back to ancient Greece and ancient Rome and using that language in new art, um, and in this case, in architecture. So this is Brunelleschi again. Remember, he did the one of the door submissions, and he designed the Duomo. Uh, this is the old sacristy. And you can see um, some classical elements. Uh, I'll point them out. Uh, this is called a Corinthian pilaster. So it's like a column, but it's really just right here on the wall corner rather than in the round. And the Corinthian is just the way the top of the pilaster is designed. Um, we have lovely molding in this gray kind of blue color that divides the space up into these rounded um, arches. And we have between them these sort of triangular, what we call pendetives. Um, and, of course, the round arch here and classically dressed religious figures on either side. And then, of course, the crucifixion. One thing that's interesting is that the grid lines on the floor, um, when you're looking sort of across the room, um, really give it a sense of that linear perspective. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, well, two things. This was commissioned for the Medici family. Um, for their family church. Um, so again, we have the Medici's commissioning important art. Um, it's showing classicism mixed with Christianity. So there's Christian images and there's classical elements. So there's this fusing that we're starting to see as the Renaissance progresses. Um, and then um, if you analyze the plan of this and the way it's laid out, um, it's playing with numerology mostly Christian number symbolism, like three for the Trinity or 12 for the disciples. Uh, this was also commissioned by the Medici for their um, courtyard, we think. Um, it's uh, Donatello's da David um, from 1440. It's made out of bronze. 
it's my height, five foot two one eight inch. I'm seven eighths inches, but yeah, so it's about my height. And um, you can see here he's a bit effeminate and sensual, which is a very unusual way of depicting David. So just in case you don't know the story, David was a very young shepherd boy who was not trained to be a warrior. He was just tending sheep. Um, Goliath threatened the Israelites. Um, he's a giant. He's strong. He's violent. And everybody was afraid of him. But God speaks to David. David gets a slingshot and some stones, takes Goliath down with a single stone to the head. And so here he is standing on Goliath's head. He doesn't look like someone who just killed a giant, does he? This is very interesting how sensual his body is and the hair and the flowers on the hat. And there's been a lot of um, work and study done on why this is. Um, but one suggestion is that um, it's just for pleasure. Um, this particular story was popular in Florence because it's uh, a city that is into civic virtue, the intellect, education, rather than a heavy, heavily militarized state. Um, and so the idea that this young boy could take down the brute strength of Goliath um, was appealing to them. And then this is a piece of furniture that would be designed to hold a woman's dowry. A dowry is what a woman brings to her marriage. Um, it's by Zenobi di Domenico. And the scene here is to promote loyalty. Um, it's very extravagant. And really, we start to see this kind of extravagant um, furniture, tapestries, um, ceramics, all to decorate and show um, sort of your art sense and your wealth in, within, within the home. Um, so wealthy families were commissioning things like this. Um, and the front panel of this particular piece of furniture um, is a classical scene of patriotism to remind the bride and groom of the importance of family words. This is a great work. Um, so um, this work shows Hercules and Antaeus. And this is an ancient Greek, ancient Roman story. Um, Hercules, uh, well, it's a very long story to talk about Hercules. But in this specific scene, Hercules is fighting Antaeus. And Antaeus has special powers given to him from the earth. They fight, they fight, they fight. Finally, Hercules uh, figures out that he needs to separate uh, Antaeus from the power he gets from the earth. So he has to, to squeeze him to death with his feet off the ground. Um, there's a definite interest in anatomy. Um, it's almost like the subject was taken specifically to um, provide a subject that the artist could explore um, the dynamic movement of humans. Um, and it's meant to be seen um, in the round. And then finally, we have the birth of Venus. Um, so this is a classical painting um, in that the birth of Venus is a classical story. And she basically is born out of the ocean onto a clamshell. And she's beautiful and um, is, a, in this case, has Zephyr, the wind god, blowing her shell to the shore and an, uh, a spring goddess ready to wrap her in, in a modest way when she gets to the shore. Um, it's a little strange for the Renaissance in that um, nobody could hold themselves up standing in the position that Venus is standing in. So it's not realistic, uh, but it's very idealized and very much a story uh, that is classical. Um, some people compare this to a tapestry because of its flatness um, and sort of its patterning. Um, but it's become a famous painting that we think of now when we think of the Renaissance. All right, so I am not going to go over discussion questions with you. I'm going to leave it to you to think about the lecture and read the text. 
and I will see you for the next chapter on the Renaissance.